All right. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to our natural selection, the ethical dimensions of genome editing, organized by Public Science U of T and support from the National Engineering Month, Ontario. <coughs> My name is Kathy. My name is Natalie. And we will be your co-host today. All right, great. Um, so before we get started, we just want to acknowledge the land that our club operates on. Um, so for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and study on this land. Our agenda for the evening is as follows. To start, we'll give a brief introduction to Pueblo Science and our club's mission. Then we will introduce our amazing panelists that we are so honored here to um, have um, accepted our invitation. Before jumping to the bu uh, bulk of our today's discussion on the ethics of genome editing. So to give a bit of context to the topic that we'll be discussing, we will introduce to you the controversy surrounding the use of genome editing on two baby girls in China. And at 6.10 or a bit uh, later, 6.15, we'll start a roundtable discussion until 7.25. So as mentioned earlier, we are members of Pablo Science. We are a registered Canadian charity founded by scientists and engineers. Our mission is to advance STEM education across the world and create lasting solutions to poverty. We do this by running a series of programs designed to engage students and spark their interest in science through fun, hands-on, and community-relevant learning. But just before we start, if everyone in the audience could please turn on your camera if you feel comfortable, but please keep your mics off. If you have questions or opinions you want to share with us throughout the roundtable discussion, you can pop it into the chat and one of our members will read it out for you or you can raise your hand via the Zoom function and you'll be asked to unmute. Finally, as we are discussing a very highly controversial topic today, please remember that if you'd like to express your opinion or ask questions to our panelists, please do so in a respectful manner. And we are honored to introduce to you to our panelists. First of all, we have Professor Jennifer Mitchell. Um, she's an associate professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Cell and System Biology. And she uses CRISPR, sorry, CRISPR genome engineering to study stem cells. Next, we have Professor Carrie Bowman, who is a clinical bioethicist at U of T in family and community medicine. Dr. Bowman follows a range of bioethical issues, including ethical questions in emerging technology, such as CRISPR-Cas9, cloning, and reproductive ethics. Next, we have Professor Janelle Taylor, who is a medical anthropology, anthropologist at U of T. Her research and teaching focuses on anthropological perspectives of how people dealing with illness make meaning and how the meanings make matter in the world. And finally, we have Professor John Berkman, who is a moral theologian at Regis College, U of T. He specializes in fundamental moral theology, healthcare ethics, and theological anthropology. So now um, let's prime our discussion with an introduction to the CRISPR baby controversy. So in November 2018, two, two girls named Lulu and Nana changed the world. They are the first humans with artificially edited genomes. The twins, now better known as the CRISPR babies, were created by a scientist named He Jiankui. The now infamous experiment was made possible by a very revolutionary genome editing tool known as CRISPR, which allows researchers to edit very specific regions of an organism's genome. This technology, albeit powerful, was previously never tested in humans. Dr. He attempted to make a specific change in the DNA of the then unborn twins in the hope of rendering the twins immune to HIV infections. The edited gene might be passed down to the twins' children if they decide to have any, and may then be passed down to their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, and on down the generations. This incident was a huge controversy across the globe within the scientific community, bioethicists, governments, and the public. CRISPR-Cas9 and genetic engineering raises questions like, who will be allowed access to this new technology? And how will this contribute to existing disparities within healthcare systems? And how do we incorporate any religious perspectives into the discussion around ethics? 
Thus, it leaves us here today to have a necessary conversation with experts in various fields about the ethics of genetic engineering and the various implications that they would have, that they have or would have in the future. All right, so to start us off, I would like to invite our panelists, each of um, them to give a brief introduction on their stance and view on you know, um, the uses of CRISPR in your field, if that's applicable, and what do you think about the most important ethical implications at play in the situation and with this new technology? And um, why don't we start with um, Dr. Jennifer Mitchell, and if you could give us um, uh, your opinion on this issue. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in the panel today. Um, so I'm a researcher at the University of Toronto. My lab studies uh, fundamental biology and fundamental aspects of how um, our genome regulates um, function within our bodies and how that can go wrong in disease contexts. So from my perspective, the CRISPR tools have been a huge um, game changer in terms of fundamental biology and also investigating disease mechanisms in cells and model organisms. This uh, technology, because it actually is quite straightforward to use, has been rapidly applied to almost all areas of biology um, and has really changed the way we do experiments and it has allowed my lab to better understand how the human genome functions to regulate critical processes like the differentiation of nerve tissue um, and to understand how that sometimes goes wrong in a disease context. So from that standpoint, this technology is um, incredibly useful and important and has made um, really important new discoveries uh, possible. At the same time, as much as I think that this has been a really important technology for fundamental science, I personally um, feel that it should not be applied to the human germline. Not now, and perhaps you know, not even in the future. So I'm uh, fairly conservative in my views on that. However, I do think that um, genome editing, this type of technology can safely be applied to uh, chronic diseases for modifying the genome in adult cells, so in a way that would not affect future gener generations, to uh, deal with genetic diseases. And that's already, um, some of that technology is already making its way to the clinic. Um, but I don't think that it is a technology that should now, and perhaps not in the near future, be um, applied to edit the human germline. In situations where um, genetic diseases, where parents are known to carry genetic diseases, the current approach of uh, selecting the embryos that do not pass on that um, genetic mutation is much safer um, and is an effective approach for not passing on a detrimental um, mutation to your children. And so that's my stance on um, editing the human germline, that I don't think we should be doing it now and not in the near future. Thank you so much. And Dr. Taylor, could you uh, give us a bit of uh, your opinion on maybe the cultural impact of such a powerful technology and your opinions on issues like that? Yeah, I, thank you. First of all, thank you for organizing the event and for inviting me to take part. Um, when uh, we were corresponding leading up to the event, I was asked to declare my stance on CRISPR. Yeah. And to be honest, I don't have one. I don't have one that I can just, I don't walk around with a ready-made stance about every technology that's out there. Um, but I do think that there are questions that I would think would be important to ask about this as any other technology. So my stance as an anthropologist, as a medical anthropologist is basically that technology and medicine are part of social life. And so that's how we have to understand them and think about them and consider their possible um, ethical and, and social consequences. And so for example, some questions that I would want to ask um, about CRISPR might include things like, you know, what, how are people um, imagining <laughs> what this technology is, how it works, and what it might help them achieve. These kind of 
cultural imaginings that shape what we bring to technology and what we hope to get back from it um, have huge consequences. And just to take a really simple example, um, you know, when people describe CRISPR, they talk about it as surgery, or they talk about it as hacking, or they talk about it as like editing, or they talk about it as targeted drone strikes. Um, these are different, they're all metaphors, right? And any metaphor will highlight some things and hide other aspects of whatever it is you're trying to understand. But they can have different consequences because for example, if we think of it as editing, well, that sounds really sort of small and safe and always positive um, versus if we think of it as targeted drone strikes. So, you know, I'm interested in just the the ways people understand um, anything like these technologies and how those understandings guide actions that we take individually and also collectively. Um, the other thing that I would really think is important to pay attention to, most most technologies are designed by someone to for some specific purpose, right? Um, but once they enter into the world, they can develop all kinds of new meanings and uses and um, and purposes. They'll be used in all kinds of ways that the original um, um, developer may never have thought of because that's the, what humans do. We're creative beings. And uh, most medical technologies, just to kind of limit it, have um, at least several different possible impacts, right? Medical technologies, what we call them medical because they have at least the potential to cure something, right? There's some form of human suffering that they can alleviate. And that's the main concern, right? But many of them also have a potential for enhancement. So like when you're no longer talking about curing a, a disease or a problem, but just sort of making ourselves better or making our children better in some way, guided by all these ideas that we have. So there's cure, there's enhancement, and often there's also a coercive dimension that goes along with any of these technologies, um, that it could be used for surveillance, that it could be used for, you know, um, to, uh, you know, further some other kind of oppressive goal of manufacturing I don't know, you can get into all kinds of dystopian sci-fi fantasies about what it would do, right, uh, in that direction. But the thing to pay attention to is that um, the these different potentialities don't, they don't get, they don't play out equally, right? Often the people who will have access to the curative potential, um, that's one group they may or may not be the same people who have access to the potential to use this for enhancement. And often, you know, it's people who are already oppressed and uh, disadvantaged and marginalized who will be on the receiving end of any kind of um, coercive or surveillance potential that the same technology has. So um, once a technology lands in the social world that is very unequal, it will play out according to that, you know, those differences. Um, and I'll just stop there. There's more to say, but I'll just stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and we'll definitely dive more into some parts of what you brought up. And we think it's an, an excellent point. And, um, but now um, we would like to invite Dr. Kerry Bowman to uh, give us your opinion on this issue and sort of, you know, if you want to follow up on, on some of the questions brought up by our previous two panelists, that would be great as well, but um, I'll give it to Dr. Kerry Bowman. Right. Now, I don't want to bore you by talking about myself, but I, my career is a little strange and it, I should probably just clarify what I actually do so you have some sense of where I'm coming from. Absolutely, I'm, I teach at U of T and I am a bioethicist. I've been working in the Toronto teaching hospitals uh, for almost 30 years, very directly, very bedside. Um, I also do a huge amount of environmental work and it's really at the interface of, of human need and environment. I'm presently working in both um, South America and Central Africa on those projects. So I try to be a realist. Uh, I have many ethical doubts about you know, what lies ahead in terms of gene editing and, and CRISPR-Cas9. 
I also think it's coming and I think market forces will drive it. And I think we can tie ourselves in knots as much as we want and our governments can, but I think market forces will drive it. And you know, I do think we have to figure out how to do it well. Uh, where I think there's emerging consensus, I actually feel very, uh, you know, Dr. Mitchell laid it out quite clearly. My, my views on its use are pretty well parallel to, to Jennifer Mitchell's uh, clearly stated views on, on the use. I've worked bedside in hospitals. I've seen what some of these single gene mutations can actually do to a, a person and to their family. And, and so I do think that is coming. Um, you know, but, but, but let me just look at the big picture for a moment. I, I, I was actually a little uncomfortable when I saw that the Nobel was going to CRISPR. I wasn't outraged as maybe a few people were. I wasn't losing sleep over it. But, you know, the greatest problems in bioethics right now in the 21st century are really not about gene editing or anything like that. It's actual access to basic unsexy health care. Um, we're talking about high tech stuff for maybe 15% of the world's population. And when you spend time in Africa and, and you know, low income countries all over the world, it's not just Africa, uh, you see the very basic non-tech uh, needs are there. All of that overlaid and underpinned by the deepening environmental crisis. So, you know, I actually felt that, you know, the Nobel going to CRISPR was quite a diversion. In fact, it, it kind of surprised me in that way. Um, as an ethicist and as a clinical ethicist, you know, I, I came of age in the last millennium makes me sound ancient, but I did. Um, and, you know, bioethics originally focused a whole lot on, on let's look at a risk benefit equation. But when you look at gene editing, CRISPR, Cas9, risk benefits are really, really hard to do. And you take a utilitarian view, here's the benefits, here's the risk. Because, you know, we can't project into the future and, and this constant haunting off target question is always there. How, how significant off target risks are and what they would look like. I've never gotten a clear answer on that from anyone. And I don't criticize people. I think they don't know. And so the risk benefit equation is, is very, very problematic. And I find that worrisome. Also, you know, I think many people, maybe not all of us would agree, the last thing this world needs is one more level of social stratification between people that have had advantage. Like we were struggling enough in this world without that. And I do think that's coming. And at the risk of sounding melodramatic, I, I actually think gene editing is a much bigger deal than the media is making it out to be. Not in terms of what it can do, but in terms of the human story. You know, this is sort of the very, very beginning of, of shifting from, you know, natural selection evolution to something different. This is actually a turning point in the human story. It's a very small turning point and it's very subtle, but it has begun. Um, I, I'm very uncomfortable with, with gene editing of the germline. I think it creates a lot of injustice for, you know, an open future, as many ethicists would call it, uh, for people that lie ahead. Um, I think that can be very problematic. Um, and, you know, if we rolled this back maybe five years, we would say, well, no one's actually going to do direct gene editing of embryos. But then, the, you know, the twin babies were born in the People's Republic of China, and we all had said, oh, no one's actually going to do that. Well, it's happened. And how much don't we know? How much else is going on? So I, I think what I'm saying is, you know, cautious use and, you know, it, it, therapeutic use, but I'm, I'm acutely aware that what's enhancement and what's therapeutic is a very tough line and market forces are going to push that every way they can. And market forces is like water, you know, it, it looks for any kind of place where it can move in and drip through. It's very powerful stuff. And it tends to drive Western medicine uh, primarily. I, you know, I see it in the Toronto teaching hospitals. Um, Technology is driving medicine. And when you look at the big picture, tech solutions aren't really what we need right now. Anyway, let me leave it because I think we've got a lot of good stuff going on for our discussion. So let me stop there. And All right. Thank you so much um, to Dr. Bowman. And last but not least, we would like to invite Dr. John Berkman to give us your opinion on this issue. If you want to follow up on any of the excellent points brought up, please feel free to do so. Uh, thank you. And first, um, thanks for uh, having me as a part of this. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Um, I am uh, 
fully supportive of everything that my colleagues have said. My view on CRISPR is very similar to that of uh, Dr. Mitchell. And um, I'm really appreciative of both the kind of cultural metaphors we used to speak about it, that Dr. Taylor's already spoken about, and also uh, how um, Dr. Bowman's concern about the further kind of social stratification and the further possibilities uh, for injustices to the least of our society. I think these are all really important concerns. Uh, what I'd like to say in kind of my few minute introduction is to actually ask what we mean when we even talk about ethics and to ask some underlying questions. Because one of the things I've learned with my students is when I even ask them what constitutes morality um, or what even constitutes an ethical question, I find that there is fundamental disagreement about even what constitutes ethics. Um, so in order that we don't simply kind of talk past each other, I want to, in about three minutes, kind of give you four different, what I take to be ways of thinking about ethics in itself. Um, and uh, this question of what does it mean to be ethical or to act ethically? Now, for some people, I think as, as Dr. Bowman has already alluded to, ethics is understood fundamentally as a cost-benefit calculus, maximizing good consequences over bad consequences. Thus, any human action is morally justified if one can make a plausible case that the benefits of certain research outweigh the harms. Now, of course, taking into account benefits and harms is an important moral consideration, but by itself, it's clearly an adequate basis, I think, for morality as it recognizes in itself no intrinsic or inalienable good in human beings or other creatures for that matter that have to be respected regardless of this calculus. A second understanding I think of ethics um, that we often see or I often hear in the classroom is one that equates morality with the law that is Canadian or some other civil law. If the law permits the research, well then it must be morally okay. Again, while the law often, I think, functions as a kind of moral teacher, it clearly cannot be considered the same as morality. Otherwise, one could never challenge the morality of any law. And of course, we all know that societies almost always have certain unjust laws in them. Now, I think a third perspective will argue that human law can never adequately display what is morally good adequately. Rather, there, that there is some notion of morality as objective in some way built into the fabric of the world or of human nature. Those who argue, I think, for a universal ethic do it from many different perspectives, but often speak of, say, a natural law or a moral law or a divine law, which we can recognize as human beings and which should guide us morally. A fourth perspective that I think can be related to the third sees morality as part of what it means to be a human being. Uh, and for example, uh, that uh, it's shared with other animals, which is to flourish according to our particular nature, to exercise our capacities and um, abilities as human beings, as our species. To a large extent, whether or not human beings flourish will depend on their decisions through their intentional actions. Good, virtuous human actions facilitate the human flourishing of both individuals and others, and we should think of wrong actions as those that obstruct human flourishing of those individuals or of others. Morality is fundamentally about my choices and my intentional actions. And thus being moral consists in acting according to say what are classical virtues like acting justly or faithfully or lovingly or temperately. And in so way that becomes a part of our character. So I think when we're thinking about these ethical questions, we might kind of want to ask which of those kind of categories of ethical argumentation are coming to the fore, even in the questions we ask. Now, I also want to affirm uh, what Dr. Taylor has said in asking what are our underlying metaphors for thinking about gene editing? Or what are the particular attitudes we bring? What are our uh, views that we tacitly perhaps hold about how we see human life and the life of other living creatures on the planet. Now for much of the modern period, the view has been that all of nature should be in the service of any and all human desires. And thus the project of modernity of conquering or revealing the secrets of nature, which has more or less been our Western project since Descartes and Francis Bacon. 
But as a result of that attitude, we've come to the ecological crisis that we now find ourselves in. So I take it as a given that our moral perspective should not simply be that any and all human desires should be catered to, although we are, of course, all tempted to think in that way at times. So what is our attitude towards our lives? For example, if we fundamentally see our lives and those of our children as gifts given to us, and we see our lives as fundamentally good, we hopefully will not inordinately grasp at new technologies without adequate reflection. On the other hand, if we think that the world gives us no guidance for action, that evolution is, for example, meaningless, then we may well think that it's our job as human beings to fix things and to bring about progress and growth um, through manipulating the world. Um, I think there's one attitude um, uh, that we might call the myth of progress. Um, the Nobel Prize winner in 1946 for Gen X was Herman Muller. And he argued that what we should be concerned with is planned genetic improvement to provide the opportunity to guide human evolution to make unlimited progress in the genetic constitution of man, to match and reinforce his cultural progress and to reciprocally be enforced by it in never ending succession. Um, and, and of course, he thought about this as going through a certain kind of selective breeding and positive eugenics, et cetera. Now, interestingly, originally, his models for what we should be modeling these future human beings on were Karl Marx and Lenin. However, though, at some point, he later got unhappy with communism and he changed his exemplars uh, for this um, ideal of improving human beings to Abraham Lincoln and Louis Pasteur. Now, the point here is not the particular figures which he happened to choose in his day, but to recognize that everyone who wants to genetically improve humanity will always want to improve it with some moral ideal in mind. And who should these ideal exemplars be? What do we want to see humanity look like if we want to improve it in these kinds of ways? Should it be saints like St. Francis of Assisi or Mother Teresa? or admiral political leaders, whether our admiral political leader is say Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela, or perhaps Donald Trump or scientists like Louis Pasteur or perhaps Herman Muller himself. What I hope to bring to discussion is to have us recognize and reflect on what are our goals underlying our thinking about gene editing? What are, do we see as legitimate and illegitimate purposes of gene editing? And can we hope to agree on them? And if we disagree, is that a reason to be very careful in terms of what our country ought to approve in terms of allowing the use of the technology? Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Berkman. Um, so to start us off with our first question, I just wanted to address this question to everybody. Um, based on what has everybody is been saying around human identity and progress and how our society would look like, um, I just wanted to ask, how do you think that the notion that humans can become our own creators impacts um, human identity? And maybe I'll just start off with Dr. Bowman. What a question. <laughs> Yeah, you know, there's a whole movement out there of people that believe that, you know, the transhumanist movement that uh, we've had a dog eat dog struggle in terms of our own evolution. We, we came close to going extinct as a species, which we did at one point. Uh, we're lucky we're here. Uh, we now have the opportunities that are emerging. We need to take control of this situation. We need to use tech as much as we possibly can um, and become the creators. And I you know, don't know what percentage of the population they will be, but certainly there, there, there is that thinking out there. Um, you know, I, I'd rather look to what can we, you know, if we're looking and we're seeing suffering, which certainly we are with, with some kinds of long-term and lifelong illnesses, I think that's a very reasonable place to be intervening uh, with what we can do. And, you know, it, it's sounding a bit idealistic already, but, but, you know, looking at the interventions we have, how can we use these uh, to reduce uh, suffering? Um, 
and illness, you know, and that's a tough one because that's going to drift into different people's conception of what's an illness and what's a disability and what's not. But I do think, you know, I've seen what some of these nasty single gene mutations can do. And I think that's a very reasonable place to start. But when I say start, it, it already implies that we're going to just keep going. But I do think that's where we could go. The transhumanist kind of thinking that I, I've described, it's very science fiction. It, it's not where I'm at. Um, I don't think we have to design ourselves. I think we have to go back to uh, really what jo Dr. Berkman is saying, you know, what kind of a society do we want to be and what are our values? Those are the questions to ask. I'll leave it there. Okay, great. Thank you. I wanted to also ask um, Dr. Taylor if you had an opinion about how um, like humans can be are creating this new society with this new technology and how we impact on um, human identity with this new technology. Yeah, so uh, one of the courses that I teach is a freshman seminar called Speculative Fiction and Social Reality. And we're reading science fiction and thinking about how it both reflects the world that it comes out of and has impacts in the world. And it's really interesting because I think with with something like CRISPR especially, but also with many other technologies, you, you sort of, you can't really separate out the hype and the science fiction dimension from the technology itself because, you know, these stories are so key to um, how the hopes that, that motivate the development of the technology as well as the fears that then, you know, crop up around it. And I was thinking about the kind of quintessential story of humans being their own creators or humans creating humans sort of in a, in a way that bypasses what we might think of as natural um, means, which is Frankenstein, right? Frankenstein creating the monster. And, and it's, you know, if all you know about the Frankenstein story is some vague memory of the movie, um, I'd really encourage anyone to go back and read the 1818 book because it's really rich and it's really rich partly because it um, it shifts perspective. You know, we get so many different perspectives on the story. First, we hear from, um, you know, a guy who's piloting a, a boat who's on a boat headed to the Arctic. And anyway, there's I won't go into the, all the details, but there's like many, many different stories we get. And eventually we get the story from the perspective of the monster, right? The, the, the being that Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein has created. And then the whole uh, meaning of the story shifts, right? Um, and I think that this shifting of perspectives is really important for how the story sort of gets us to think in a complex, um, rich way about what it means to to kind of create human life or to have that ambition of creating human life and just to cut to the chase uh, the one of the main lessons that i take from reading frankenstein what it has to offer us for thinking about these questions about science and the implications of creating people is that you know most of what was wrong with um, Victor Frankenstein's act in trying to create a human being had to do with his hubris, had to do with his lack of care for the thing he created. Like he created this monster and then just ran away and kind of like abandoned it and, and hoped that nothing bad would happen. Now, of course it did. All kinds of bad things happen. You hear echoes of this in the way that people are you know, talk about CRISPR. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna just edit these mosquitoes and then all the whole species and, and then nothing bad will happen. Well, maybe, you know, but I, I think there's like a responsibility to care for the creation. And there's another key dimension of the Frankenstein story is that Victor Frankenstein did all this in secret and alone and without any kind of input, oversight, communication, from uh, his family, his broader community, the community of science. He wasn't properly educated in even the sciences he was trying to practice. So really the question is um, what kinds of uh, not even just um, discussion and inclusion of perspectives, but what kind of 
um, governance, what kind of oversight, what kind of um, social organization of science do we want to have and do we need to have in order to have ethical outcomes for something like CRISPR? Thank you so much. Um, I see Dr. Mitchell has something to add also. Um, if you could go ahead, Dr. Mitchell. Yeah, so just, I mean, coming back to this idea of design, should we design better humans? Anybody who tells you that they know how to do that is sorely mistaken. I mean, people who understand as much as possible about how our genome works haven't the faintest clue how to make anybody better right now. Um, aside from, for example, correcting very simple single gene mutations where it's very clear what's causing a disease state, those are some things we have a pretty good handle on. But, you know, for example, because, you know, we started with this CRISPR babies example, that the, the, the desire to modify that gene didn't come from out of, out of nowhere. So there's actually, I, I don't know if everybody's aware of this, there's a clinical trial that's ongoing um, to uh, introduce a specific mutation into that gene that is naturally occurring in the human population and has been shown in at least a few patients to allow patients to clear an infection with HIV. So there's currently a clinical trial um, to edit, um, not the germline, but to edit uh, T cells even of patients that have HIV to mutate that CCR5 gene so that HIV cannot gain en entry in into immune cells. And even in that trial, it's not the hematopoietic stem cells that are being altered, it's ma more mature cells so that eventually the patients will recover their functioning copy of that gene because that gene is actually important for fighting other infections. So this individual decided to try to mutate an important immunity gene in you know, unborn children to potentially help with you know, the rare possibility of one infection, but at the same time may have caused them to be more susceptible to other infections. And so I just bring that up to say that, you know, nobody actually knows how to do that right now. You know, we, we have ideas of how to fix very specific problems that are, you know, clearly malfunctioning proteins because of mutations that cause specific diseases. So we could theoretically do that. But in terms of enhancement, you know, we don't really know how to do that properly. And so it's, you know, it's, it's Wild West territory, or it's like asking somebody who to build your house who doesn't even know how to hammer a nail. Like it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty out there right now. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for that insight. We also, um, and then I saw that Dr. Berkman had his hand up earlier. So if you wanted to add your insight to the question as well. Well, I obviously have to get in on this one because you asked a, a pretty clearly theological question. Um, the very notion of ourselves as either creatures or creators is so clearly a theological reference, right? We're creatures. When we speak of being creatures, we're talking about our relationship with God, the creator. And thus, this is a really interesting metaphor because Clearly, the relationship between a, a creator and a creature is an unequal relationship. Human, what humans create, we do not have an equal relationship. They are things that we create through our techniques, through our abilities. But then the language we use about having our own children has never been create, but to beget because the children, we, they're not our creatures, they are our children, they are of an equal status with us. And we are clearly are not of an equal status uh, with those things that we create. And we see that in, in Mary Shelley's work, we see that in Pinocchio or all kinds of examples of stories. And so in a sense, this question of becoming our own creators is becoming in a very strange relationship with ourselves or our offspring. 
can we really see our children as our children if they are products of our technique, products or creations of us rather than begotten by us? And so I think this metaphor of creature and creator is very significant. And we have to recognize that the creator and the creature can never be on an equal footing with each other. Um, and so just to reflect, I think, on that metaphor is, I think, a very important one. Thank you so much for all the great insights that stem from this one question. And um, yeah, I, I feel very much enlightened about so many great perspectives. And now I would like to actually go into one of the um, questions that were raised by one of our audience members. And this is a question from Asher. And they want to know, given the panelists consensus on human German editing, I'm curious what the panelists think about CRISPR editing of germ lines of non-human species that might, might get put back into the wild. For example, mosquitoes for malaria, uh, malaria control, as biological control of invasive species that currently cause ecological damage, or agricultural animal plants to improve food resources and nutrition. And um, I would like to direct it maybe to Dr. Mitchell, if you could sort of comment on uh, if you have any thoughts on that sort of that aspect of CRISPR as it's it's used in you know research and and things like that, or Dr. Bowman, <laughs> either either one of you. I mean, I can just quickly say that I um, I don't have a lot of expertise in in that area in terms of of for example you know gene drive and um, in pests like mosquitoes, but again. Our environment is incredibly complex and incredibly complicated. And, you know, again, if you, if you do look to literature, there are countless examples where you tinker with something and it has effects that you did not expect and it's not usually good. So, you know, I would exercise extreme caution and I'm highly skeptical that we can 100% say that we're not going to cause harm that way. So again, I'm I'm pretty conservative on that point as well. That you know, it would have it would have to be a hundred percent clear that that we weren't going to cause more harm than good. And and it's not really my area of expertise, but but yeah, that's right. my view. Thank you. And I saw that Dr. Taylor has raised her hands. And could you lend us your opinions on that? I think it was me. No, oh. Dr. Taylor, did you? I did raise my hand, but I would like to hear from you first. Oh, yes. you sure? Oh. But I'm a oh, windbag. You. He'll be yes. sorry. Dr. Um, Bowman, please. Yes. <laughs> you know, we barely understand ecosystems. Barely, barely, barely. And they're crashing. We are losing biodiversity. We are wiping species off the face of the earth on a daily basis. Um, so we barely understand what we're doing. And, you know, gene drive and mosquitoes and these types of things, you know, we're dealing with a lot of the rise in vector-borne diseases, zoonotic diseases are very, very much tied to, to massive assault on the environment. And we're looking for a tech solution to that. This very pandemic that we're immersed in now is very much related to the loss of tropical forests it's a long equation. I'm not going to, you know, it would be a separate presentation if, if, if we were to go there. So I, I think that that could be very damaging. I really don't think we understand the big picture. And we're, we're trying to fix something without getting to the core of what is causing this. Um, but look, is it going ahead? It's going ahead in Key West, Florida. It's going ahead in, in regions of Brazil. When I say it, you know, gene drive related to mosquitoes. So these kinds of pilots are going ahead, but you know, I think it's very dangerous. Gene editing of, of other species and for species survival. I mean, when you look at the, the, you know, the Asian macaques, which are of course monkeys and the gene editing of them, you know, you, they've been introducing features like autism. And in terms of suffering, you take a sentient social species like a macaque. Remember, obviously they're nonverbal. So when I say social, it's not social as we humans would, you know, it's nonverbal social. And then you impair their social functioning. I mean, what, how far do you want to go with torturous 
awful stuff. And, you know, it's because they're not human that we feel like we can do all these incredible things to them. Um, you know, I, I think what, one of the things where CRISPR may really drive forward, when I said market forces will drive it, you might have been thinking, but, you know, the government of Canada is certainly going to legislate this and that. I, I actually was thinking a lot about environment. And, you know, there, there's life forces like algae and things like this. So there's a lot coming. And I worry that the surveillance on CRISPR in relation to the environment and other forms of life will be much, much uh, more slight than it would be for humans. Dr. Taylor, sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm, you know, I'm not a biological scientist and I'm obviously not an expert in this, but we share a lot of our genome with all kinds of species that are much more distant from us than chimpanzees. I mean, we share lots of our genome with um, with bacteria and yeast and all kinds of things. And I think it's just, um, we are animals among other things. And it's a mistake to overlook that. And I think, you know, the part of what I was trying to, the point I was trying to make before about people having ideas that motivate these uh, development of technologies that you have an idea about what you want to accomplish and the problem you want to solve and how you're going to do it. Once it lands in the world, it has all kinds of consequences that you never would have anticipated. Um, and those need to be attended to really carefully, even just to understand what is the impact of anything that we do, right? We need to be paying close attention to those things. And um, the more powerful the technology, the more imperative it is to be really, really humble, I think, in terms of uh, unleashing these things on the world, because um, those unintended consequences will come back to us, and they do come back to us in terms of you know, creating antibiotic resistance through overuse of antibiotics or creating all kinds of environmental consequences that, that come right back to our own health and the very things, the very problems we're trying to solve. Thank you. Um, that was really insightful. Um, so our next question is actually one from the chat from Patricia, and she's just wondering, what about ethics in culture DIY bio or like do-it-yourself biohackers? Um, do you think there's a need to regulate um, cultural um, aspects of genetic editing or like DIY bio? Um, so I want to ask this to Gen Jennifer Mitchell, Dr. Mitchell. <laughs> else first please okay yeah sure if anybody <laughs> else has anything else to add uh dr bowman if you would like to um add anything you're muted sorry <laughs> why don't we ask dr berkman first then i'll go second how's that is that okay okay yeah, yeah. that's okay sure uh, i think there's a really <clears throat> massive under recognition of the power of this technology and the potential harm that could come about through it. I mean, think we just lived for the last year and a half through a pandemic and we don't definitively know the origin of the virus, whether it simply came from nature or whether it came out of some laboratory and escaped, et cetera, et cetera. The potential for new variants which are very easy to produce through CRISPR, we have no idea of the potential damage. When it comes to viruses, we may think of COVID-19, even though it killed millions of people, as a relatively weak virus compared to some others that could have been far deadlier. And um, these are the kinds of things that I think can relatively be, could possibly be manufactured by your average teenage biohacker uh, if it's really a matter of changing one or two genes. So I can't say I know the exact genetic makeup or variant of this virus from other flu viruses or related viruses, but governments of the world don't seem to have a recognition of the potential power and disastrous powers of such creation of viruses or other organisms. Um, 
I mean, everybody recognizes that nuclear weapons and nuclear bombs are extraordinarily dangerous for the future of the planet. But um, I think one has to be aware of these potential viruses that could be easily as damaging as nuclear weapons. Uh, and so that's a quick way to say, yes, I think there's good reasons to regulate certain kinds of biohacking. How you would go about doing it, I have no idea. Uh, Dr. Um, Bowman, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I'm certainly not going to be supporting biohacking, but but let's just talk about the you know the social genesis of it. <clears throat> When you actually talk to biohackers, which I have done quite extensively, actually, and I, they don't all call themselves biohackers, but they're DIYs, do-it-yourselfers. Um, what they say is, you know, science is conservative. It's extremely slow moving. It's not particularly democratic. And the priorities of science are usually really very much out of alignment with the priorities of the people in general. And it's increasingly swayed by pharmaceuticals and profit-driven industry. Um, so the rationale for biohacking is, and I'm not, I'm not trying to glorify it here. That's not where I'm going, but, but it's not gonna go away. I mean, this is a significant social movement. And, you know, CRISPR-Cas9, to my best understanding, and we'll soon hear from Dr. Mitchell, is not incredibly expensive, and you don't need a $3 million lab to do it in. You can do it in, in, in many other ways. And, you know, when you look at the kind of social movements that you see in California and things like this, these are very powerful movements. If you spend time in California and you see, you know, just flush with tech money, how powerful that this kind of uh, biohacking movement is. It really is a substantial social movement. I don't think it's going to go away. Um, it has no checks and balances. I don't know how you're going to be able to monitor it. I, my mind is still open. I think some good may come out of it, but it could be absolutely catastrophic. Um, but it is, it's an increasing movement and people doing it, there's massive gaps in terms of their scientific training, massive. They do tend to be clever, um, but you know they don't have all the solid building blocks for doing these things. It's not going to go away. And you know, I, I think as the twenty first century progresses and the environmental crisis deepens, uh, I think biohackers may take things into their own hands if they don't like the way things are going, and they probably won't. Thank you so much for for your insights. And um, does anyone else have any insights to share on the to topic of biohacking? Dr. Mitchell, maybe? Did you have something to say? Um, I mean, I, I just think it's incredibly dangerous, you know, like um, we've, so there, there were a few early successes with gene therapy um, for example, for severe combined immunodeficiency disorder, that's the boy that boy in a bubble syndrome. So, you know, there was some early success with, with that kind of technology that actually delivered a functional gene and um, helped children with that disorder to have a more functional immune system so they didn't have to live in a bubble anymore. But a large enough percentage of those children developed um, cancer as a result of that treatment. And so that, because that happened, you know, we, we basically stopped that kind of approach because it was, you know, causing harm, right? And so I think that the most likely outcome of some of this biohacking is that people are gonna give themselves cancer. <laughs> like. That's the most likely outcome. And so I just think it's incredibly dangerous. And, you know, people do really need to be careful and they do need to respect, you know, that, that this technology can modify their genome. And most modifications to the genome cause, do cause trouble rather than, than anything beneficial. So, yeah. Thank you so much. And Dr. Taylor? Um... I saw your uh, hands were raised. Yeah. Yeah, I don't actually have a lot of knowledge about biohacking, but you know, the idea that they are going to sort of take matters in their own hands because they feel excluded from science, think that science doesn't care about their issues and doesn't 
you know, prioritize things that matter to them, that suggests to me that um, ultimately there's a big picture question about how we organize science socially, right? Like how can we actually uh, include people in such a way that they're not going to feel like they're going to go out and be rogue, go rogue on themselves? Because, you know, the, if the hope of um, controlling, regulating any of these things is to have um, active oversight of science by scientists and by the, the public um, and their elected representatives and all this, all these good things, um, it, science itself needs to be as inclusive as possible um, to bring people in. Thank you so much. And um, on that, I would like to sort of ask a follow up question, as um, I have noticed from um, our panelists opinions on, um, you know, too much is unknown and uh, uh, and the, the idea that the, if we are to judge on, you know, uh, the, the risk and benefits of it, um, is, the, is it reasonable to expect that there is some point where we can sort of say that we have known enough? to declare if the benefit outweigh the risk and if we should do it and, and who should have a say um, to sort of include that, um, uh, that, that, that voice in our scientific discovery and sort of include their voice, have their voice heard. Um, so, so I would sort of, um, to rephrase my question, I guess, is to, to, to what extent do we need to know about this technology and um, uh, how much does it have to be developed for us to sort of make a judgment and who should make that judgment on whether or not we should um, uh, put restrictions or to say, let's go for it. And um, I'll just uh, give a few moments for, for you to think about that. And if anyone has an opinion, please, you know, let us know. And um, yeah, Dr. Bowman. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's many ways of looking at ethics and risk benefit equations, we could call that utilitarian. I, I don't think they're ever going to be wonderful when it comes to this type of things, because risks are just simply, they can also be so far off, uh, you know, so far into the future, and, and often quite unknown. Um, who should be involved in the decisions? Well, society, but that's a very simplistic answer. Society doesn't have one opinion. And we're, in an, we're living in an extremely complex, pluralistic and morally pluralistic society. So it is not going to be easy. Um, we need broad, broad discussion on these types of things. Um, and when you get hit with a crisis like the pandemic, you know, I was doing a lit review in advance of this seminar today, the one we're on right now on CRISPR. And boy, have things fallen off at, during pandemic times, right? It, the media is not that interested. I, don't, I shouldn't say they're not interested, but pandemic dominates. So we need a huge amount of discourse on, on this type of thing, but how we're actually going to move forward, I don't know. And, and I think where we might get legislation on, you know, can we edit human embryos? Can we not? We're, we're developing consensus on that. But I repeat myself when I say, the, you know, when we start editing algae and mosquitoes and things like that, I suspect we're not going to have a lot of legislation, so I don't know. Let's see what my panelists think. My co. Thank you, Dr. Bowman and um, Dr. Berkman. I saw that you have your hands raised. Yeah, it's interesting. the The issue that originated modern what's called bioethics in the 1960s and 70s was the question of experimentation on human subjects and the abuses that had been going on in various places, Tuskegee and other places. Um, and one of the things that often becomes very clear is that historically, and it continues, that experimentation on human subjects up until a real strong regulation relatively recently, um, and even when you have this regulation, typically goes on the underclass of a society. Um, your blood donors, the people who agree to do experiments and get paid to participate in them, they do it because they need the money. Um, my roommate in graduate school was this poor guy from Scotland. And, uh, you know, he was constantly going over to the medical center to get experimented on because he needed the cash, you know. I mean, now he's a full professor and head of department at Yale. He would no longer do that. But, you know, if you look at the kinds of, of people who, who participate in these, it's because 
they need the money um, and they take, you know, undergo these dangers of being certain kinds of guinea pigs. Um, and there's a certain fundamental injustice in that. And I think in terms of people claiming that um, it's safe enough to be undergone, um, such experiments should be willing to do it on themselves first, uh, because hopefully then they're really gonna take seriously uh, the potential risks and benefits. And, or if we really think this is truly good for our society and it's a social good, then there should be a kind of conscription for research subjects. Everybody from the prime minister on down should have an equal chance of participating in these experiments. And if we really thought that everybody in the society could contribute by being a subject of experiment, I think we would have very strong controls in terms of risks of experimentation. When we only experiment on prisoners, on the poor, on children, et cetera, et cetera um, the controls over them, I think, are inherently less strong. Um, and But if this is really about the common good, then I think everybody should be willing to participate in such experiments. And if the powerful had to do so, then the controls, I think, would be very good. So one of those two, either on yourself or make it so that everybody in society has to be willing to be the subject of such experiments. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Taylor? Well, I just want to second the point that, you know, that Dr. Berkman was making that, um, you know, the risks and the benefits get allocated often to very different groups of people uh, in line with all the other inequalities that we have, right? Um, but I also wanted to just um, disagree a little bit that, that uh, we don't experiment on ourselves or society because we do. We just don't call it that, right? I mean, we 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 just we have massive, uncontrolled, <laughs> unthought through experiments going on around all kinds of products and and medications and things that are are being consumed, used on a vast scale without a lot of uh, attention to what the possible implications may be. Which isn't to justify it, but just to say, you know. Yeah, there's a there's a lot going on out there um, that isn't carefully thought through, and I think we could do with a lot broader um, discussion involving more people. I mean, I, I guess I want to just really second Dr. Bowman's point that we need a lot more attention, a lot more discussion, a lot more discourse around all these things. Thank you so much. Um, and um, we have a question from the uh, audience, actually, to sort of follow up on that. And um, it's from Neo and um, Eileen. And they are wondering, do any of you think that it should be this technology um, to, advocate, to advocate for the outlawing of this technology is justified? And if you anticipate that this will be eventually outlawed um, in some countries or all, uh, in all countries, we'll come to a consensus. And would that could that be considered to be anti-progress and your opinions on that? Okay, Dr. I Mitchell. Could, I mean, I put something in the chat already, but yeah. so, you know, I think a good parallel to considering should we, should we, should we intentionally modify the human germline is cloning. You know, we, we, as a, you know, society decided that that was not allowed, that it would, it's not legal. So in my opinion, this is, is you know, this is a sort of similar to that, it, that you can't, it's very hard to make a case for it being necessary. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think that's the best sort of comparison. Um, Thanks, um, Dr. Bowman. Sorry, Dr. Bowman, you're muted. We can legislate some things, but you know what, what's going to go on in you know Burkina Faso, and you know people can set up labs anywhere in the world. So I, I think things will, you know, even cloning. I'm not pro cloning, but as a monozygotic twin, how weird is cloning? Like, is that really a freak show? You know, like I, I'm not supporting it, but you know, one could argue it's already occurring within nature. So, you know, there, there's there's always those things to consider. 
you know, I, I don't think we're going to be able to stop a lot of this. And, you know, there may be stuff going on all over the world that we don't even know about now. Um, and again, you know, what, what forms of life are we looking at? I, I think our greatest chance for legislation would be, you know, the human element. But if we look to reproductive ethics, which is a slightly different story, you know, Canada is absolutely stuck. You know, we've got the Act, the Human Reproductive Act of 2004. It's shockingly outdated. Uh, you know, and I work in reproductive clinics. It's almost useless. It's so outdated. And, you know, we're doing the Canadian thing. We're sitting on the fence. We're waiting to see what other countries do. We're to hum, hum, hum. You know, and, and so we may do a lot more of that, I think, in the future. And this one's going to be tougher than the Reproductive Act, I think. Thank you so much. Um, and um, I'll give it to, oh, I'll give it to Dr. Berkman. I think, um, again, the analogy with nuclear weapons is apt if, this technology can be equally dangerous. Sure, countries can be doing it, but the world still spends a lot of effort trying to control or limit access to the manufacture of nuclear weapons because it considers the more widespread proliferation of them to be extremely dangerous for the future of the planet. So yeah, I believe that there's no doubt that various people, countries, etc will seek to be engaging in this, but if it in fact is as potentially dangerous uh, as the proliferation of nuclear weapons, I take it that's a good analogy for reasons why there ought to be certain controls over it, if we believe that it can be that dangerous. And maybe I'd like to turn to Dr. Mitchell as an expert on this technology as to whether she thinks I'm correct in, in terms of the dangers, potential dangers of it. So yeah, I, th I think the potential dangers are huge in terms of editing the germline, partly because 98% of our DNA does not code for genes and we actually don't know what most of it does. That is my area of expertise. I study that non-coding genome and how it turns genes on and off and how it regulates function. And we know very, 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 very little. <laughs> so, you know, what is a one base pair change going to make in that 98%? We don't know. You know, in some cases, probably nothing, but in other cases, maybe a very serious problem, you know? So I do think that this technology is not even close to being ready to apply in a situation where you're going to change the genetic makeup of a healthy individual. It's just not ready. At the same time, there are very horrible single gene genetic, single mutation genetic diseases. For example, progeria that causes the early aging of, of children starting from two years of age, and, and they usually die at around 14 years of age, you know, with horrible complications from this disease. You know, if we can deliver a, um, you know, editing, if we can actually edit that mutation and fix it in enough of their cells, we could massively increase the quality of life for those children. And I think that's worth it. You know, that is 100% worth it because, you know, if, if there's not a lot to lose there, right? You know, they have a short life expectancy. There's a lot of complications. And there's a lot of potential to do good in that situation. And so I do think we should apply it in those cases. And in those cases, I think the potential risk um, is much smaller than, than the potential benefit. But, but yeah, I, I think we are massively overestimating our understanding of the human genome to even think that we should start to change things that aren't that kind of very specific mutation that we really understand what's going on. Thank you so much. Um, just feeding off what has just been said about not knowing or having like very little research concerning um, surrounding diseases. Um, so that many drugs that we use to treat difficult diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis are being used without fully understanding the mechanisms and the potential long-term effects based on the fact that it provide, currently provides therapeutic benefit 
and because there are no other treatments available. Um, so given that, given that we do not have any reliable therapeutics to treat genetic diseases, do you think that it would be worth the risk to use this technology and provide effective but potentially risky treatment? There's anybody, yeah, sure, Dr. Taylor, if you have anything to add. Okay. I think here again, you get into a, a question where it's not always easy to separate treatment from prevention, from enhancement, right? If, uh, for example, if you're talking about discovering a genetically linked condition and then intervening in the individual who's inherited that to, to alter their, their, you know, their genes, maybe even their germline, you know, to, to kind of really intervene with CRISPR in that way, um, then you get into lots of tricky things because many of these conditions, so just, it's not hypothetical. There is a, a, a familial variant of ALS that happens to run in my family, okay? So my, my aunt, my uncle, my grandmother, and other people farther back all died of this. Um, I, I don't know if I have it. I mean, there's a test. I'm not gonna take it because to be honest, they all lived to about 60 before they developed this condition. And I personally, I'm not willing to say that um, that the, the 60 years of life they may have had before this condition manifested itself means nothing when weighed against the potential to eliminate that, that disease and its very real suffering that comes with it. So, I mean, I think like, the the idea that um we would be able to just eliminate these problems still gets you into really thorny questions about how to value a human life how to weigh potential futures against um you know the the suffering that might be might be alleviated um and it it reminds me of what the disability scholar adrian ash who herself was blind a philosopher um and disability sort of scholar, she talked about the sin of synecdoche. And synecdoche is like this abstract, is this, this grammatical term for, you know, how a metaphor describes one thing in terms of another. Synecdoche is when you describe something in terms of its part, one part of it. And she was trying to make the point that if you judge a whole person in terms of the one trait, whether that's a genetic a susceptibility, a disability that's acquired, you know, there can be one trait. Um, and that's the only thing that you can uh, assess the value of that life. You are radically foreclosing all the other potentials that the, that anybody has and all the other talents and aspirations and, you know, experiences that people have. So I guess I would just um, want to caution once again against um, the fantasy that this is going to be a simple fix, even if it's just about uh, solving a genetic disease. Yeah, and maybe I'll, with that, I'll just pass it back to Dr. Mitchell, who knows much more. Just to clarify, I was talking about somatic modification, so not changing the germline, even in those disease situations. So to try to help the individual as a patient who has very debilitating disease. Um, in that case, I think it's worth it, but still not modifying the germline. That's um, just to clarify. I see, so um, I just have a sort of follow-up question to that. So um, I've heard, a, 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 I think a consensus from our panelists saying that it, the germline is sort of the threshold where we draw the line. And um, is there any, you know, uh, particular, you know, concerns that we should raise up about about germline editing specifically? Um, because I think that was one of the reasons why the CRISPR baby were such a controversy. Um, and, and, you know, like the, the impacts it might have on the human gene pool and, and what we do to our children, for example. And if you, um, if any of you have any, you know, additional thoughts that you would like to add on that. Uh, 
I guess this though is the question like why is that a no go like yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean so I mean that that is the scenario where the patient can't give consent right <laughs> that's one reason I think and also where if any unexpected harm does come from it then it's 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 harder to get ourselves out of that problem, right? If what you're doing is making somatic changes and not altering the germline, those changes don't get passed on to future generations. If you're changing the germline, then they do. And so it's a very, very different, different thing, right? Thank you. And I saw Dr. Berkman. Yeah. I think there's a certain point where we really do not want to take responsibility for certain kinds of things. I, I mean, just following up what, I mean, Dr. Taylor was saying about the sin of synecdoche. Um, remember when those two baby girls, if they grow up and they find out that because of this gene modification, they've got a deadly cancer or all kinds of other disabilities, it's no longer, well, this is providence or this was an act of God and nobody tried to act in this way, but this is my lot in life. But when you know that a human person intervened and through their specific intervention, in a sense, gave you these characteristics that you would not otherwise have had, that's, you know, that seems to be much more troubling. I mean, you wanna talk about future lawsuits, I mean, of, of a wrong that this that this scientist did to you. I mean, gee, some people even sue their parents just for having them born. I mean, that seems to be insane. But now you're starting to get into a real sense of real harm that you do to other people that they couldn't, um, uh, you know, consent to. Uh, and so there really is very good reasons for wanting to say we need to leave things alone because we ultimately don't want to be and shouldn't be responsible for the consequences of certain things that we could do. Uh, and if we have a certain humility, we should not want that responsibility upon ourselves. Thank you so much. And um, with that, unfortunately, we are running out of time and I have seen so many great questions in the chat, but unfortunately we cannot take all of them up. And I'd like to say a big thank you to all of our panelists and for every, for, um, to everyone that have come to our events. Thank you so much. And I, now I will give it to uh, Natalie for several points that we would like to, for you to know. And uh, I'll give it to Natalie. Thank you again um, to everybody who participated and um, of course to our panelists. Uh, we hope that you were able to learn a lot about the different perspectives and um, about surrounding the ethics of genetic enhancement. Um, this event was not possible without the funding provided by National Engineering Month Ontario and the support of our panelists and our Pueblo Science team. Um, we just wanted to remind all of our attendees to fill, please fill out the poll that we have um, on Zoom and our post-event survey that will be open right now. And in addition, we also Pueblo Science is looking for um, to recruit more volunteers to create TikTok content and video tutorials for an ebook of our science experiments. If you are interested, please sign up via our website, which will be posted in the chat down below. And so thank you everybody for um, participating and we hope that you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone. Thank, thank, you, for, you, everyone. thank you for your participation. Thanks. Thank you. I hope you have learned something new. <laughs> I definitely did. I definitely did. Yeah. Thank you so much, especially to our panelists. Thank you for coming. I've learned so much from you. Thank you for the invitation, yes, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. I learned a lot.